Hello, Rocky Mountain Bible Church. Uh, it's Pastor Travis here, continuing to work my way through the epistle of First Peter. And uh, today, I would like to uh, dive into a very interesting and challenging passage in chapter 2 of First Peter, uh, really dealing with the Christian and our submission to the government authorities. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, and I'll uh, lead us with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your word. I just thank you that your word is truth. And God, that um, with the help of your Holy Spirit, Christians can balance all of the truths and uh, principles and um, all, all the different things that we have in the, in the word of God. We can balance them all, um, again, under your wisdom, under your leading, under your teaching, Holy Spirit. Um, we can balance them all and glorify you in a society, in a culture, in a world that desperately needs to see goodness and light and truth. So help us to do that as believers and help us to take in your word as we should and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so First Peter chapter 2, uh, what you see in this chapter, we've already really kind of started into this section, and I really want to start around verse 11. But I want to ask, uh, I want to ask you guys, I want to get us to ask ourselves, what is the good life? Um, what does the good life look like? What does that consist of? Is it, um, is the good life, um, Bentleys and, uh, houses in Malibu and, and Breckenridge, Colorado? Is that the good life? I know that that's the good life according to the world, according to even um, our culture, and uh, even according to, I think, some Christians in America, they would say, ah, the good life is having everything I want and um, living it up. But what's the good life according to God's good book, according to the Bible? Um, and specifically, what's the good life for an, angel, an alien or a stranger, which is what uh, Peter has called us as Christians? This is not our permanent home. Uh, we won't be here forever on planet Earth. Um, uh, we're more than just passing through, though. We're meant to make an impact and make a difference as citizens of heaven today. Even though we live on Earth, we're citizens of heaven, and we're called to make an impact and, and uh, to be godly influences uh, to point people towards our King and Savior in heaven. So, uh, what is the good life as a Christian uh, knowing Life is not our permanent home, uh, this life on, on this side of, of heaven here on earth. It's not our permanent home. We're just aliens and strangers. But what does the good life look like for us? Well, I want to go ahead and read uh, 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. And um, as, as I mentioned, we've already covered some of this. But I'm just going to go ahead and read this again because I really think this sets the stage for the text today. It says... Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evil doers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God. Okay, so what does the good life look like? That's the, that's the question we're trying to answer here. And the good life, uh, I think in this verse, tells us that we're not, to, we're not to focus on temporal things, but eternal things. Verse 11 makes it clear, not these uh, fleshly, we're not to seek out fleshly satisfaction. Why? Well, because it wages war against our soul. How does, how does living in the flesh um, and uh, fulfilling those fleshly lusts uh, attack our soul? It's like uh, the enemy's strategy to take us down. Because um, there's no satisfaction in satisfying the lust of the flesh. Um, unlike uh, eternal things, focusing on eternal things and godly things, which do have eternal satisfaction. Um, so we abstain from that, um, and that is good. You would say, okay, so abstain from evil fleshly lusts. Uh, how does that glorify God? It glorifies God because we're submitting to him, because we're living according to his program and his design over our lives, as opposed to what the world says um, and how the world thinks we should live. We, we live according to God's, God's standards and what's best for uh, us as his children. 
um, as he as he uh, prescribes in his word. Um, so that glorifies God and um, it protects us from this war against our soul. Uh, verse 12 continues and talks about this uh, excellent behavior and good deeds. And I would really say this is the good life. This is the good life in the text. What does a Christian, what does the good life look like for a Christian? Um, really, it's to have good behavior and uh, to have good deeds. That's living good. That's um, behaving good. That is the good life. So I tried to come up with uh, with a good slogan to capture that. The good life is living good. The good life is living good. It's doing good. It's behaving good. It's having good deeds. The good life for the Christian, for the alien and stranger in this life is, is actually living good and doing good, behaving good and excellent. Jesus says it this way, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what he says, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16. So the good life for a Christian truly is this excellent behavior and good deeds, according to verse 12. It should make sense to us as Christians, and maybe we don't talk about it very much because it's so, um, I guess it's just, it's just so obvious that our ethical behavior, our morals, are given to us by God, um, not the world, and our morality or our ethics should be much higher than the world's morality or ethics um, because they're dictated by Almighty God, the creator of all, all life, and, and he knows what's best and right and good. And so when the world says there's this standard and God says there's this standard, we should obey God's standard. It's always better, always higher. And in doing so, we will have these this excellent behavior, we'll have this good deeds, we'll be living good, and we'll experience God's good life, what he has uh, really prescribed for us. And I really think that manifests in us fulfilling the two greatest commandments of loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, that Jesus called us to live that out and, and fulfill um, both tablets of the, of the Old Testament uh, commandments, the Old Testament law. Uh, we love God. We love our neighbors. We we do the things that God has called us to do uh, when we live that way. And you'll see, you'll see, it results in the good life and living good for God. Good behavior, excellent behavior, uh, good deeds. So I want to roll through this good life and, and really tackle uh, seven key concepts that God has given Specifically, though, in the realm of dealing with the institutes of mankind, so uh, the government of mankind, all of these key concepts are essential and good. I'm going to go through them quickly. What we have to figure out as Christians is how to balance them. So again, these are all good. They're not. They're in a logical order, but not necessarily an order of priority. They're just all prescribed by God. And so, let's roll through these. And I really get these from. Um, these key passages. Um, so how are aliens to deal with the government? Uh, how are Christian aliens, people passing through deal, to deal with earthly governments? I believe that this applies across uh, all, all, year, all years, all, all the millennia since Christ came, and um, all governments, all whatever, this, because it's God's word, it's enduring. Um, it tells us how to live in America today, but it also informed uh, the people of Peter's day and, and uh, everyone in between on how they should live with respect to their government. So I'm just going to read the full text of 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, and, but know that these other texts, Romans 13, 1 through 7, and Titus 3, really 1 through 3 and, and down on to verse 8, are, are key in knowing how Christians should live with respect to the government that they are placed under. Uh, so 1 Peter 2.13 says, Submit yourself, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 
So what is the good life? The good life is living good, having excellent deeds, excellent behavior. Um, it's the first key concept we have here for the good life with respect to the government is Christians are to submit to governing authorities. Now, uh, Romans 13, 1 says it this way, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authority. We just read in 1 Peter 2, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether king, governor. And then Titus 3, 1 says, remind them to be in subject to the rulers, to the authorities, to be obedient, and so on. So what is this word subjection or submit? It is the same in all of these texts. Um, it literally means to set under or place uh, oneself under. Um, so it's hypotasso, H-Y-P-O-T-A-S-S-O uh, -S -S in the Greek. Now, why would this be something so essential for Peter to state? Christians are to submit to their governing authorities. Why? Why would um, a Christian living, you know, in the first century need to hear this? Maybe it's because Christianity is so new and they hadn't really processed all of this and they, they thought, hey, God is my king. The emperor in Rome is um, not a follower of God and, and likely pretty evil and corrupt. Uh, why would I submit to them? Why would I submit to Caesar when God is my king? Um, and even... Some people worshipped Caesar or the Caesars as God. There was a, a cult that essentially said the Caesar um, was God. And so a Christian would struggle with that. How can I follow one who is clearly not God, but yet people say he is God and worship him as God? So Christians would struggle with this. Um, but the statement still needed to be made, and it's still totally true. It's from God's word. Christians are to submit to the governing authorities. They are to set themselves under these, um, these rulers and these powers. And we'll get to why next. The reason why Christians are to submit is because the authority of these rulers and governors is uh, given to them from God. And so... Really, God calls us to submit because he placed them in these positions of authority. Um, so that's a very key concept to understand that God did this. God placed them in power. Romans 13, 1 says, For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. In First Peter, uh, the, the text we already read, um, emphasizes that as well, that whether the king or governors, they are sent by him. Um, so God establishes the rulers. So that's a good thing for Christians to know. And they also should know that this is something that appeals to people from, in, in the sense of our testimony and our witness. The way that we um, point people to God is, I mean, it is heightened. It is um, stronger when we let our light shine before men such a way that they see our good works and they glorify the Father in heaven. And so uh, the world wants to see Christians as law-abiding citizens. It helps our testimony. It helps our witness. It helps them uh, see a good reason uh, to consider Christianity. So that's the challenge for us as aliens, to be law-abiding citizens, to point people to God. Um, <clears throat> now, Let's see, this is maybe chopping off part of this. I'm going to just make a slight adjustment here. I have this quote from uh, Thomas Schreiner uh, from the New American Commentary, and it just says, Unbelievers view Christians with suspicion and hostility because uh, the latter did not conform to their way of life. That's a weird way to say that. But what he's saying is, uh, believers did not honor the typical gods of the community. They didn't obey. Um, they didn't. They didn't do the frivolous, um, lawless. Uh, I don't know if lawless is the right word. Just um, sinful, uh, evil behavior that uh, most people in the, in the world do. Um, and so they, in in not joining in with everybody in their typical behavior. Uh, Christians would be viewed as uh, subversive and evil in, the so in that social context. Does that sound familiar to the world we live in today? 
Um, is the world say Christians are weird and strange and sometimes evil because we don't prescribe to um, the, the way of life that, that they say is, is best? So the truth of the matter is, is um, the world is going to be predisposed to not like Christians, say we're bad for society, but I believe Christians are the best part of a society when they're following Christ and honoring God, loving God, loving their neighbors. Um, and so some evidences of that are uh, from the second and third centuries during the Antonian and Cyprian plagues. Uh, Christians were the first ones on the scene to help the people who were suffering with the plague hands-on, serving them, loving them, and helping them. And because of that, because uh, they did good deeds like that and loved their neighbors and um, honored them, honored humanity, uh, Christianity really spread in the second and third century. And before long, it was in the fourth century adopted as um, the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire. And so, you know, Christians should be the best part of the society, that we should be that uh, salt and light. We should be that uh, refining aspect and in, in, in loving our neighbors. We should point people to God. And so this is a key part of the good life is really living good. And um, however, there's this key concept. God's word is a higher authority than man's word. And when they're in conflict, we are to submit to God and not man. So this is what I would call the Acts 419 principle. Acts 419 says, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. In other words, God wants us to do this thing. You are telling us not to do this thing. What's Do I choose men and their word, their edicts, their commands, or do I choose God's commands? Of course, this was in the context of Paul and John, uh, I'm sorry, Peter and John preaching the gospel. And um, they were commanded not to. And they said, of course, this, um, we're going to go on testifying what we've seen and heard um, there in Acts 4. They're going to keep preaching the gospel because God wants them to. And that's more important than what man says. So this naturally creates, I believe, a tension in the life of a believer. Uh, we are to submit to the governing authorities, but we are above that to submit to God. And when they're in conflict, God's word is the... Uh, is the ultimate authority over man. So there's natural tension that comes from these two statements, these two concepts. The next key concept is that the good life, uh, sorry, specifically God gave rulers and authority to punish evildoers and praise good behavior. Now that's what Romans 13, uh, three and four say, do what is good and you will have praise from these authorities. Um, but if you do what is evil, be afraid for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who practices wrath on the one who practices evil. And it's in this text as well, 1 Peter 2.14, um, the governors are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise or commendation of those who do what is right. And also uh, Titus 3.1, remind them to be in subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Actually, that one probably doesn't need to be in there, but... Anyway, sorry. Um, so who bears the sword against evil behavior in our society? Um, I'd say the police primarily do. And I would argue that this concept points to the fact that Peter um, was still, he was still in the context of definitely a, um, uh, a government that was used to control um, good and bad behavior as opposed to just controlling all aspects of life. Um, so when, when a government commends good behavior, um, in other words, when there's commendations given or praise given to those who do what's right and good and who are heroic and, and serve the public good, um, that establishes good behavior. And when they, and we don't think about that a lot, but there's definitely all kinds of medals and things that are given for good behavior, uh, for, uh, living excellent lives and having excellent behavior. Uh, by the government. The government acknowledges that. They definitely acknowledge that back in Roman times as well. They would erect statues and um, give special favor to citizens who um, basically served others well and served their communities well. And so um, I think that 
you know, Peter and Paul both had this in mind. Um, so knowing that, I think God instills in us a desire to establish governments that protect people from people. In other words, um, protect um, people's rights, protect people's um, goods, and protect their, their property, things like that. Um, when, you know, eye for an eye, for tooth for a tooth, that was part of Roman law, that was part of Jewish law, um, but also just to make restitution. When you, when you break some, somebody's arm, you can either get your arm broken or you can pay. And that's something that kind of changed over time. But, uh, you know, good governments do that. So, um, I'd say the U.S., though, has an excellent form of limiting government, abs you know, absolute powers. There's a balance of powers. Why? Because people are evil. And if you don't balance the powers and you don't control power, um, because people are absolute evil, um, I mean, they're, we're sinful by nature. Um, you've heard it said um, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. I believe that's true. So I'm going to pause this just for a second and pick this back up with the next thought. All right, so related uh, to this previous um, concept that God gave rulers authority to punish evil and praise good. Um, I got this from John MacArthur, but he talks about how, in an interview I saw, talked about how God ordained authority in the world. Conscience is a personal authority, so it's that with knowledge, that understanding of right and wrong that God embeds in us, Romans 1. Family is a parental authority, so parents are there to create correct bad behavior in their, in their kids, uh, when they're kids, so that when they're adults, they behave in good ways. And then church is a spiritual authority, so what's right and wrong in God's eyes is promoted by the church, is established by the church. Uh, well, it's established by God ultimately, but we're, we're there in a society to help present that and, and maintain that. And then government is the social authority. So uh, civics, how people treat each other, how people live their lives with respect to one another, um, doing what's lawful and good. So here's the question. Uh, what happens when the this government, uh, that that authority, starts to praise evil and punish good? Um, what happens then? What happens when they try to step into spiritual realm and define right and wrong for the church or the family um, or even conscience and go against what God clearly reveals in his uh, creation um, within the in inner man knowing right, and right from wrong. I think that's a scary thing when that happens. Um, they're not doing what Peter and Paul said that they exist for. Um, they're, they're acting contrary to, to what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to bear the sword um, to punish evil, and they're doing the opposite. Um, and they're, so anyway, this is, this is definitely a concern. I would say religious freedom is at risk, uh, family freedoms are at risk, and conscience um, loses its effectiveness. All of these things kind of lose their teeth when the government steps in, causes a lot of problems. Solution is just to pray and uh, make a difference when and how we can. So next key concept is that uh, submission is not just motivated by fear, but also by conscience. Um, Romans 13.5 says, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So again, this is the knowledge of right and wrong. When you disobey the government, um, you have an uneasy conscience. You don't feel right about it. That's another reason. You're not just afraid that they'll punish you, but you're not afraid of getting caught, but you don't, it doesn't settle well because you know as a Christian you're supposed to live a good life. I'm not going to spend too much time on that one. So the next one is uh, um, submit as free people and yet as bond slaves of God. That's the next key concept. Second to last one here. So Acts or First Peter 2, 
Uh, 16 says, act as free men. Do not, your, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but as bond slaves of God. Um, 17 says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Um, you know, Jesus said it like this. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. Um, you know, we hold that thought on that verse, but the, the key that what we're trying to say here is really in, in verse 16. Uh, we're free in Christ. We're free from uh, the, the fear of death and the punishment of sin and bondage to sin. We're free from all these things. Um, and so because we're free and forgiven, we should never um, use that as a license uh, for evil, for doing any kind of sin. But rather, we want to be bond slaves of God. Um, this is doulos. This is that uh, willing submission and servanthood to Almighty God. Uh, we do that. We're slaves to God because he bought us. Uh, he saves us. He redeems us. Uh, so we're redeemed, but we're, we're set free, but as slaves to him. So there's a lot to that topic, but um, we should never, never use our freedom as, as a reason uh, or... I guess, to justify bad behavior. That's pretty clear as Christians, although a lot of Christians do that. I think true Christians should never seek to justify evil behavior. Okay, so this is the next key concept. A government that does not hinder uh, tranquil, quiet, godly lives of dignity that also allows the gospel to be proclaimed is an ideal government. Where do I get this? This is from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. It says, I urge you, that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Specifically, verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So if we're told to pray for a society like this, where we can live uh, tranquil, quiet lives, um, godly lives with great dignity. Um, we should, we should pray for that. And we should, if, if we live in one that's like that, that's established like that, I would just say, uh, we should fight for it. We should, we should definitely support it and continue, uh, desire that it continues and do things that help it continue. And this honestly reminds me of the, I, I can't help but wonder if our founding fathers thought of this when they put together the First Amendment in our Constitution's Bill of Rights. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. The right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. We have this in the United States Constitution. It is a very excellent document. We definitely uh, love it and support it because uh, this is an unalienable right. This is a God-given right that uh, the forefathers saw that we should have the right to worship freely. Um, so the key is, is we need to balance all of these. We just rolled through them quickly. I'm not going to read them off. Uh, they are in the notes. But juggling all of these, balancing all of these concepts is challenging and difficult, but it's absolutely essential for us. And I would just say we need to submit to the Holy Spirit. We need to seek God to be able to balance all of these today. Um, I think during Paul and Peter's day, Christians were verbally assaulted, um, but the state was kind of indifferent in general. Uh, obviously, later when uh, Peter and Paul, well, when they were executed, Nero, Emperor Nero, is very hostile to Christianity. And so you've got to think when that government was at that level of evil and hatred towards Christianity, uh, this, this form of submission. Uh, the Christians were really processing how this works. Um, they were saying you can't gather as Christians and we'll kill you if you do. But they said um, we're commanded to meet. And so they kept meeting. 
Um, but anyway, it gets complicated in these in these days. John's so the Apostle John today he had to he had to figure this all out. Um, as Christians were enemies of the state, um, and I think people did that well. And the reason why is because by the mid third century, uh, Roman law was modified uh, to apply. Um, I'm sorry. Might need to edit that out. So by the mid third century, laws were made that uh, basically represented all people in the Roman Empire, not just Roman citizens, which I didn't mention earlier. So I'm probably going to cut this all out. Anyway, I need some editing here. Point is, it's very difficult to balance all of these biblical concepts. And depending on what the government is asking of you, you have to pray and seek the Lord about how to do this. Uh, it's not going to be straightforward or easy. Um, but by the mid or late 4th century, Christianity was adopted as the state religion because Christians had done such a good job um, really glorifying God of living the good life and pointing people to God. Uh, many governments have come and gone since, but we live in a world today where there's this democratic republic, it's established by the Constitution, and we need to ask ourselves, what does, how do we respond when the government tells us not to go to church, and the government tells us not to have Thanksgiving celebrations or to gather for Christmas to celebrate the birth of our Savior? Um, we need to, we need to seek the Lord about how to apply all these biblical concepts and ask, um, I think one of the key ones, the key tension provider is that God's word is a higher authority than man's word. And so when they're in conflict, we need to submit to God rather than man. Um, there's a lot to take in, a lot to weigh. Um, so think about it and um, email me with questions or comments. But we live in, we live in difficult times. And honestly, different Christians are going to come out on different uh, in different positions with a lot of these things. And that's okay, because there's a matter of the conscience at play here where we have to do what's, what we feel is right according to, to what God is, how God is leading us as individuals. Um, but obviously, at Rocky Mountain Bible Church, we're convinced to continue to meet and continue to present biblical teaching uh, for people who can't join in person or who are convicted. Uh, that they shouldn't or can't for whatever reason. So just cl summary statement really from Peter here, verses 16 and 17 in 1 Peter 2. Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves for God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Those are the challenges from Peter. Uh, again, we're called to not fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Um, we're to honor people and honor the king and absolutely love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but fear, that type of reverence, is reserved for God alone. So I want, I want to just encourage you, uh, the good life is living good, and it really is a good life to be excellent in our behavior, to honor God with what we do, with our good deeds, uh, to be people of prayer, love and fear God, to love our neighbors, and to submit to the government, honor and submit to the government uh, to the best of our ability, again, with this, with this tension in mind. So that way we'll do what's truly right, we'll live the good life, and God is honored in that. I'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you, thank you so much for showing us the way for the good life. Um, it is not easy, but it is. Uh, in a way, we're empowered to do it by your grace and by your spirit. And uh, we know we can we can honor you uh, and fear you as we should, and also honor mankind and the government and submit to them as we should when we submit to and follow you and your word above all. We love you, God. I just pray that you'd use this teaching to glorify yourself and that we would be used as we do good to live this good life to point people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
right, thanks for joining.